Hello and welcome to my fourth week of interviewing 21 Paralympians around the world during lockdown. And they don't come much bigger than my next guest. He is a two-time Paralympic 200 meters champion, multiple marathon winner, and all-round Superman, really. It's Richard Whitehead. Richard, hello. I, can, I see you're already lined up for a mascot battle with me there. That's it. Got my old <laughs> friends behind me. Come to join the, come to join the party. <laughs> so where do I find you in lockdown and, and who, are you, who are you with? Yeah, so Nottingham uh, is my, my place of birth and that's where I'm, I'm living at the moment. And with the family, uh, so with Val, AJ, Andrew and Zara. Yeah, so we're, uh, we're, we're finding it quite tough. Um, as you can appreciate, having two little ones, uh, five and seven, uh, missing school friends, missing the routine of going to school and uh, interacting with lots of different people instead of just the parents guiding and supporting their education, which is, which is quite tough for, for us as well as obviously the kids. And um, I'm obviously doing my training as well. And to be able to manage that, those expectations and try to kind of juggle that time is, yeah, it's tough. Um, those that are finding it easy at the moment, I'm not sure how you find it easy. Uh, I think um, whether it's training, whether it's education, whether it's work, um, just having to do that in one place, not, not having that interaction, not having those resources or that team, um yeah it's definitely had a had an impact uh, on my life and also gives me a little bit of reflection time in how important your team is around you because you're one of the hardest trainers around so are you able to get anywhere near close to 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 what what you would have been doing normally in terms of training at the yeah moment? I, I think i think when when you look look at my what i do in a in a normal week to to now it's about trying not to lose lose anything moving forwards and then picking key areas where you can maybe not necessarily find gains but have experience, different experiences to, to add value to your performance moving forwards. I, um, I rely on my team um, quite a lot and uh, my team's put in place to, to support that and without them... Uh, actually physically at my sessions that has an impact on the performance gains I get from those those sessions so for instance I've got a home gym I've got a fully loaded gym at home but you can only train up to a certain standard and then after that you need that that uh, that motivation inspiration from your team to to push on and I definitely am finding that um, as an athlete I'm at a level and then to then exceed that level where I need to to have those gold medal moments every day that's where those experienced trustworthy team members that you have around you are really important so to get around that we're using things like this um, uh, to to socially interact and just keeping those conversations flowing throughout the uh, the isolation period and also kind of having those conversations with your team that maybe you don't have day to day around anything that they want to import, any, any areas that they feel um, I need to improve or they need to improve or we need to improve as a team. And um, yeah, we've had some really good, honest conversations. So even though this year has and was going to be a really important year for me, we're now planning for the next uh, 50 months. Because I was going to say, and you'll hate, hate me for, for repeating this, but you're 44 years old this summer, is that right? So the, the year-long postponement... Tell you what, I've got to see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the year-long yeah, postponement, the year-long postponement sort of probably hits you harder than some of the younger guys, would that be fair? And, and the, the kind of things that I put in place for this year, as you know, that, that probably is gonna, was going to be my last uh, Paralympics in Tokyo. So I've gone all in really with my training um i've been going the extra mile with trying new things put new team members in place to add value in certain areas um got a massive competition schedule that's had to um be been till next year and um 
also my mindset as well. My mindset's really kind of switched into this could be my last time I compete at the Paralympics. Let's kind of really go for it. All in, everything, loads of sacrifices around uh, home life. Um, and, and then to have it postponed and then at, at first it was kind of like, oh, it's postponed to next year. Then it was like, but I've got to go through all this winter training again. I've got to expend all this physical, mental energy uh, again. And yeah, it was definitely a, a self-reflection moment. And do I actually want it? Do I, do I feel it's still possible? Because I'm, I'm the kind of person, an athlete, that would, would only feel I would put myself in that position if I, if I think I can do it. And... I've got the tools and the toolkit available to do it as well. Um, so again, having those conversations with Keith Anton, my coach, and my SSC team, nutrition team around, can I physically get in this shape again next year? Um, and they still feel that I've got the attributes to do that, and it's just maybe just some tweaking in certain areas. And also listening to your body. I, um, I'm as you get older, you you you, you become more uh, uh, an athlete that is proactive instead of reactive and and then when those signs of of um, of tiredness or injury come in you you make sure you put some planning in place for that and uh, I'm definitely more uh, proactive than reactive now I would never have asked the age question if I was stood there next to you I, I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I and the thing is though as well like like, like, like we know with with Paralympic sport Age is a number and, and, and athletes do come into the sport later on in their careers, in their lives. And uh, that's why Paralympic sport is so special because it opens up opportunities for, for younger people as well as those, those individuals that have, have suffered accident or illness later on in their life. And um, it's about your athletic age, really. I've, I've really been in, in Paralympic sport probably, well, obviously sledge hockey since 2000 and like 2000 really, but um, athletics since 2011. So athletic age is probably still under 10 years. So those physical demands uh, that I'm putting through my body on the track, I'm not really feeling that at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning my trade as I, um, as I go training and uh, as I have that input for my coaching team. So that's, that's the reason why I still feel at, as you say, 44 uh, this year, that I am still learning uh, physically and mentally all the time. Because how does it make you feel then when, you know, obviously last year in Dubai you were beaten by 17-year-old and Tando Malangu. I know you're, you're an ambassador for athletics and you love your athletics, so actually you, you probably step back and, and look at it and think that's actually a pretty, pretty good thing, the next generation are coming through. But, but how did it make you feel to, to look and say, God, just just been beaten by somebody who's come along 27 years, 26 years younger. Than yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh, it's good to be able to be mixing it up at, at my age with, with uh, uh, people that are still in the teenagers um, and still feel competitive. Um, also to be part of his journey, meeting him when he was 14 years old in Stellenbosch and kind of giving him those words of advice and his team around being... Um, uh, learning all the time, trying to get the setup of his prosthetics right, uh, talking about sky's the limit, and um, even in the uh, economic situation that he was at the time, that the Paralympic movement can be a light moment, light bulb moment for him uh, moving forwards. So that's obviously that's that's something that I'm passionate about, the legacy of sport, and not just Paralympic sport, but sport generally, how sport gives you that platform to make that social change. Um, as an athlete, obviously disappointed um, last year uh, due to um, uh, some family issues regarding health. Um, I didn't race at all and went to that Games unprepared, um, but felt that I still needed to, to go and uh, be part of the... The, the story moving forwards and that's that's still important it's not all about winning it's not all about gold medals it's about um the opportunities that 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 sport arises for people and um that also gives me fire in my belly moving forwards and that's the reason why obviously that this winter i really pushed on with my training 
Uh, we spent more time out in South Africa um, and, and felt like I had another great platform pushing forwards. Uh, myself and Malangu's personal bests, uh, mine still better than his. So I always, I, I always give him a, a, a couple of digs to say, you, you're still not faster than me yet, mate. And I'm 43. So uh, I've still got an opportunity there. And um, I don't know, you, you, as an athlete, you always feel competitive. You always feel like you've got more. And, but then also, I, I will know when to walk away and when um, I've done enough. And um, I always feel that I need to have that ruthless streak in my training and competition. And when I lose that, I'll, um, I'll be kind of, I'll step back and say, I've done enough and I've done enough in Paralympic sport. And then my next my next part of my journey will um, will start. And I think because I've had so many good uh, rivalries in the in the sport as well, Heinrich Popoff, Scott Reardon, obviously Malangu now, all all differently, all, all, all differently. Some I, I don't like at all. Some are great athletes that um, that have pushed me and pushed the, 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 the boundaries and barriers of sport forwards. And that's what's, that's what's really important about Paralympic sport. I, I think... As soon as you lose that competitiveness and you lose that kind of drive and energy, that's when it becomes a little bit soft. And I think sport should be about overcoming adversity and challenges, but also high-level performance sport seen on that platform. And where does the uh, the distance running come in for you these days and in the future? Because you know you're multiple record holder, multiple marathon winner and even people who don't follow para-athletics they, they, you know, they might remember you from doing the 40 marathons yeah. in 40 days oh, yeah. Dark, you, <laughs> <laughs> like a madman um, yeah. so where, where, does the, where does the marathon or distance running fit in for you? I, I think when I, when I go back to my roots of running on the road I'll, I'll, I'll rediscover that, that passion for sport and um, marathon running is something that I am I am passionate about because of what it gives me and uh, gives the running community and the community in general. And for me, marathon running is one of the most inclusive events in the world because you don't have to run it. You can be you can be a walker. You can you can be in your chair rolling the marathons. You can be a spectator, administrator, volunteer. Um, so many opportunities to get involved. And without all those nuts coming together as one it doesn't stick together. And uh, I always say that those people that go out and watch London, New York row marathons, that are the spectators, without those spectators, the, the actual marathon runners wouldn't be inspired to run as fast or complete their challenges. So everybody play, plays their part of coming together. And marathon running obviously raises a lot of money for charities all over the world. It raises uh, people's expectations on what is possible and gives people a new way of thinking um for me it's something that i'm always going to be involved involved in i'm not sure whether i'll be still running two hours 40 in uh, in the future i think my uh, my old running coach liz yelling wants me to have another crack at that uh but we'll see um as a 44 year old it's um it's going to be hard to to be emulating those kind of times but um there's lots of other um uh, amputees, Paralympic, disabled athletes that are now pushing on because of the times that I've done. And um, when you think about platform to leave a legacy all over the world, there's no better event than the marathon because you can run a marathon event in any city in the world and that gives the opportunity for the, the community or that country to see uh, an athlete with an impairment or a disability running at a high standard. And finally, we're all kind of thinking about the NHS at the moment. This is something I mentioned to Will Bailey, Natasha Baker and one or two others. Do you feel actually like a, a strong affinity with, with the NHS as a disabled person just anyway? And then this period has, has heightened that? When, when you look at the work the NHS uh, does, and I've got family that work uh, in Doncaster in, in the NHS um, and... Uh, it's very important to appreciate that they're going above and beyond what their what their what their job or their job specification is, and um, they're going into work risking their lives to support other people. And people with disabilities that have accessed the NHS in the past 
have that affinity with the NHS because of, they understand and they appreciate and they empathise with the with the staff and and the, the process that goes on within those those uh, those hospitals. I I wasn't um, I sorry I was born with my with my disability, but I still had to access uh, the QMC and the city hospitals in Nottingham, and they they enabled me to um, have the aspirations that I've got now, and meeting so many inspirational people. That, that, that told me that a disability isn't the end point, it's the start point. And um, when, I, when I talk to my relatives that are actually working in the front line now, they're so positive around what the future holds uh, under the, the, diff, the, different, the difficult circumstance they're in at the moment. Um, I feel that we need to get behind the NHS as much as we can and provide the NHS with uh, as much support. And whether that's as public, taking on some of these, these crazy challenges like you see on social media, or just to give them that praise on a Thursday night, which um, when everybody comes outside and claps for that, that couple of minutes, I feel just that those smiles on the NHS, and NHS face is worth the effort and the, uh, the time that we can give back to the NHS. Fantastic. Yeah, well said. Well, thank you, uh, Richard. For no, 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 no. I'm, a very, I'm very envious of your chair, by the way. I like the, I like the <laughs> you've got going on back there. Mate, I tell you, you need, you need to grow these, um, these mascots as well. You've only got four. Have you given them names or are you keeping the, the normal mascot names? Yeah, well, I think I think I think they've got to keep their existing names, haven't they? But, no, I, think, I think you need to watch now. I think they need to grow as well. I'll put one in the post. I'll put one in the post. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Richard. Take care. Yeah, take it easy. Take it easy, mate.